I think something that happens in education is that we tend to swing pendulums too far into one direction. Uh, when I was a kid, we really focused on competition, really being the best student, you know, getting the best grades, you know, individual awards. That was something that was always focused on. And I don't think that was right. I think it was just too far focused on how we could beat each other. Then you move to the pendulum to the other side where there's such a focus on collaboration. And this is not always true with all schools. I'm sure many schools have individual awards, award ceremonies, all of that stuff as well. So the, the term that I really like is the idea of competitive collaboration. How do we actually push each other, but also support one another as well? How do we create that environment where we want to be our very best? When we say we want to do as best for kids, is that only the kids in our school? Is that only the kids in our classroom? Or do we want to be our best for the kids we serve, but ensure that we help other people, other educators? And so that term of competitive collaboration, it's not one or the other. It's how we focus on utilizing the benefits of both to work together so we can actually help our students. This is the focus of part of the conversation I had with David Manning. David is a retired educator, still does leadership development, really has a really interesting career. And I just love talking to him. He's someone I connected with um, in conferences in the past. Uh, we've connected over emails as well. So it was a really great conversation. I really appreciated David's perspective and we just had a great talk and I know you're gonna enjoy it. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Hey everyone, this is George Kroos and welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I am so excited to have David Manning. David and I have uh, connected by email. I know we've run it, uh, across each other in person uh, a couple times uh, throughout the career. And David uh, has a very interesting career. He was an art teacher. He is a counselor. Uh, he, he's leadership development. Basically, he's done everything you could do in a school just from having a conversation. Uh, and he's retired right now but retired in quotation marks because he still works with educate with educators works with leadership development and i'll, I'll let david tell a little bit about that but david it's it's awesome to have you and if you can just kind of introduce yourself tell us who you are uh what you do today and how you got there that's a great place to start all right thank you george <clears throat> i appreciate this opportunity to be with you mostly and and to say what i need to say that i hope will be helpful to somebody somewhere <laughs> well it's already, it's already been helpful to me so you've, if you you know it's that old, <laughs> the old adage if you can just help one person so you've already done that so you're good thank to you um okay so i'm david manning i i uh right now i've been i've been doing leadership coaching for 20 years after i ended my career uh, at, at Region 13 Education Service Center in, in Austin, Texas. Um, and so I'll, I'll just back up and, and, and say, you know, I started out as an art teacher. And uh, what I was telling George was that what I realized, you know, back then, you know, everybody said, be a teacher, be a teacher. All my buddies in high school were, you know, you know, we all let's let's be a teacher. Well, what am I going to teach? Well, I like to draw. Okay, mm -hmm. you you could be an art teacher. You know. Anyway, so so I I I did that, and and I and I did like it. But but rather than being a true artist, George, I felt like I was more of a people person, a more of a relator. Mm -hmm. uh, that that was, of course, I joined a fraternity because all my buddies were in the fraternity. Right. So rather than painting by myself in the studio, I was like, I was in the cafeteria with my buds, you know, anyway, right. so, so I, uh, so I did that. And, and I, I was telling George that while I, while the kids are working on art projects and they're creative and they're open and they're, they're relaxed, they begin to talk to you and they tell mm -hmm. you stuff that, that they wouldn't tell anybody else or any other teacher because they they're sort of lost in what they're doing, you know, and and especially if they're talented, you know. And so I decided that's what I want to do. I want to listen to kids. I want to I want to be a trusted adult mm -hmm. that 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 the kids would come to. Well, where do they do that? Middle school. They You know, they're, they're they don't they don't trust their peers. They're sort of goofy in middle school. <laughs> And, and, and their parents, they're pushing away from, and, and they're saying, 
leave me alone, but be there when I need you. Right. So who do you go to to share your problems with? You go to the counselor. In, in elementary school counseling, because I've been an elementary principal, you do group work with, about emotions, and that's that's all fun and all of that too. But and in high school, you're planning their, you know, for graduation and for where they're going to college. You're doing GPA. You know, so middle school, I thought that's the place to be a counselor, mm. and it was great. And I did it. Okay, so I went back and got a master's in educational psychology. So all of my career, George, has been one foot in education and one foot in psychology. Mm. And that fit for me. Uh, so uh, after two years of, of, at the same school, you know, which is I, which which we haven't talked about, but but it's an identity change. If you're at the same school and you're an art teacher and you're sitting in the lounge and your teachers are saying, oh, this kid is giving me trouble. And I'm like going, right. that kid, that kid was my favorite student. <laughs> he, he loved art. You know, right. and, OK, math, maybe not so much, you know. But but so so I so they would come the teachers who really I didn't have a lot, you know, I, teacher lounges anyway. So they would come in and, and, I, and they'd sit down in front of me and I had that counselor on my door and I'd be like, oh, why are they telling me all this? Oh, I'm a counselor. Sure. I, I have right. a change of identity, even at the same school. And so every step along the way, you change your identity to some extent to fit the norms and the, the expectations of the job that you're in. Mm -hmm. So my principal called me in after two years that I love being a counselor and said, have you ever thought about being an administrator? And I'm like, uh, no, sir, I, I haven't. You know, and he was a kind, kind man, too. And and uh, he said, well, I want to recommend you for a graduate scholars program at Trinity University at San Antonio. And, I, and I'm like, oh, 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 OK. All right. You know, I, I, it was just what I did. It's how I was raised to respect those people who are who are your bosses and, and right. suggest that you do something and you go, yeah, I'm going to do it. And, uh, and and so my first job, George, and this was really weird. I became the administrative assistant to the superintendent of schools. Oh, wow. Now, from, from a counselor at a middle school with, I don't know how many, 12 middle schools, you know, 26 elementary, six high schools in San Antonio, Texas, Northeast School District. The next day, I'm sitting with the superintendent at the country club having lunch with his wife, who's a bank president. I mean, Talk about blowing my mind as far as what is this job? You know, anyway, and so I realized that, OK, this was a training ground for me that that I got to see the entire district from this high level. And and uh, because I was in every every meeting he had, I, it was like a general's aide. You know, I only reported to him, not the other assistant suits, right. just just him. And, and, and it was it was a job that was fascinating and interesting. And he taught me so much. One thing, I don't want to be a superintendent, but 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 he, he did teach me. He was always giving me lessons. He was like the guru and, and, and I was soaking it up. And it came time. And, and after nine months, I said, Dr. West, I'd, I'd like to, to go to the school. <laughs> I'd like to go back to the school. Right. Now. He said, what do you want to do? I said, I'm going to, there's an assistant principal at an at a elementary school. I'm going to be an assistant principal. And he said, are you sure you don't want to be a high school principal? Because it seemed like that was the, that was the step. You become a high school principal and then you move on even to superintendent. I yeah. said, no, sir. I, my personality fit the elementary school. So I, I did that. I was an elementary school principal. Then I, uh, Dr. West called me in after two or two years there and said, Listen, I want you to, you, you got all that, that psychology stuff, right? I want you to go over to, to center school, an alternative high school, and, and take the place of the school psychologist. And I said, well, Dr. West, I'm not a school psychologist. He said, I don't care what you call yourself. That's where I want you to go because they need that. They need you. I'm like, oh, okay. So I was, I became the assistant principal. I said, call me an assistant principal, not a psychologist, at, at, at the the alternative high school in San Antonio, Texas, in Northeast School District. It was a challenging yet uh, it, 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 it formed my, you know, what I learned about those kids, even so every kid was was 
had a diagnosis of some sort. And we had this system. And the reason I, I, you know, one of the reasons I sent you that note was because we had this system that nobody else could do. You know, you, you had mentioned in, in one of your newsletters about kids having like uh, sick leave. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. And so what we did, we, we when we took a kid in, we said, we have 10 days of sick leave. You have 10 days of sick leave. These mm-hmm. are kids that are that are that don't want to be in school. These are kids that that school is not a happy place for them. And 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 so we we said we realized there's there's school adverse, but you don't have to tell us why you're absent. You just you just take an absence. And when you come back, you get but but you can only have 10. And if you're it, and another thing about that, it, and it served about tardies and it, talk about innovation was a kid could say, I'm going to take a half absence. I'm, I need to, I'm going to spend more time out here and I'll be in your classroom. They had to go tell the teacher. And we had things like distancing contracts where a, 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 a kid who was impulsive, who had that in his diagnosis, an oppositional kid where they could say, Mr. Manning, uh, I need to take my distancing contract. I'm about to explode. And and because these were, these were kids who didn't have impulse control, right? You know, these, these were kids who were not peaceful yet. As my friend wrote a book called children who are not peaceful yet. Anyway. Uh, and, and so, so, but we had these systems with behavior and points also, George, another innovation was they could contract I want to make an A. I don't want to make an A. I'm going to, I'm going to contract for a B. What do I need to do to make a C? How mm-hmm. about a D? They could contract for behavior points and academic points and close a contract, a six-week contract, like an English one, with a with a C if they wanted. You know. So these are all these innovations. So anyway, I, I did that for seven years. And talk about growing. These kids push every button you have as a human being and as administrator. Mm-hmm. And you you got to go deep inside and go like, OK, but he only did this. And here's the consequence for doing right. that. Right. You know? And I was telling you the three C's that we taught were, were uh, choices. An oppositional kid needs choices, consequences and consistency. And that was our behavior. And, and we also had a we also met every morning before school with the whole faculty and talked about the kids that were coming in and what their diagnosis was. And we had a system of labeling them with numbers as to the level of acting out or the level of suicide. You know, a kid who, who talked about killing himself was a lower number than a kid who actually did cut his wrist and end up in the state hospital. Right. Yeah. So it, that's how sophisticated it was in 1988. George. Right. Well, it's funny. It's funny. You actually said it, it, like when you're talking about the, your superintendent saying, you know, that's a psychology stuff. I'm like, that's basically what we called it. Psychology stuff. Like I just kind of were dismissive of it. You know, when I was a kid, like it was something, you know, kind of like weird, <laughs> you know, like if you're talking about this stuff is weird and now, you know, people understand uh, the implications of that. And one of the things that when I was an administrator, I used to tell, my staff and the the reason the sick leave came it was not something that I had done. It was something that uh, uh, someone in my uh, UPenn class had shared that they were doing at their school. And I used to I, I talked about how with my teachers, some days they were just off, and I could tell. I'm like, you need to go home. Like you just need some time. They're like, well, I'm not sick. I'm like, you're not like sick with a cold or the flu or anything like that. But you're not you're not doing okay. And if you if you stay here and you struggle and you're probably not going to get out of it and then you're going to be struggling all week and i would always say this i'd rather have you here for four days at 100 percent than five days at 50 and really kind of thinking about how how important that is and so that was something that you know really kind of understanding that and like we we we've in education forever uh, celebrated the kid with the perfect attendance, never missed a day of school and things like that, no matter how miserable they are. And even if, you know, showing up makes them miserable, sometimes you just need to step back and there's nothing wrong with that. Right. And I, I think we've yeah. kind of made that. Um, you're, you're a wise and compassionate leader. Well, I, I've tried to be right. I'm, I'm sure I've had pretty bad days. The the, the one thing that you said, and I, I, I love your thoughts on this. So we actually had, it, it's, it's amazing the parallels of our careers because 
no, I didn't do this. I didn't do the psychology stuff, but you know, uh, the, we actually had a very similar, like it was, it was not the whole program, but it was a similar program at our school. Um, we had some, you know, uh, some, some behavioral things that, you know, if kids would be sent to our, that program. And it was weird because the, the like sometimes the, the more oppositional, the more they'd struggle, the calmer I would get in some cases because I realized that many of these students, it wasn't that's just who they are, it was they dealt with some of the most horrible like things in that I could not even imagine happening to me. And and I would right. just say, like, oh, this is like what's happening right now. Is this kid this kid's not telling me to F off? This kid is telling the world that has done this crap to them to F off. I'm just in the way. Every every really oppositional kid that we did, they see you as a as a either a a, a principal who who was who said things to them like, yep. yeah, you did this and this and you're an yep. a-hole or whatever. Yep. You know, I mean, yep. you know, they 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 had to put that last part in there. Right. right. And, and and as an administrator in that school, I was like, this is what you did. I'm sorry you made that choice yeah. to do that. But now here's what has to happen. You know, and, and you just did it without this 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 emotional, energetic. You're a jerk moment. Right. And, and, and every kid who who either, you know, who had this impulse, lack of impulse control underneath it, George, was was a, a little boy who just wanted to be seen and heard mm -hmm. and listened to and cared about. And you have to stop everything, you know, right. and, and do it. But but what you're saying is is so important because the the when you got into their background, when when you had a when you had an ARD meeting, which is a, a special ed meeting, admission mm -hmm. review and dismiss, when you were admitted at, at, in, into center school, everybody was there to to, to go through the school, the history of the child, right. of the student. And you, you're you listening to this and you're going, how is yeah. he still even interested in right. showing up in my building today? Right. Yeah. That, that, that you know, and I, like I, I, there's this narrative and I, I'm not, I'm not a fan of it. I, I really struggle with it. They're like, oh, suspensions are like horrible. You shouldn't do suspensions to kids. I'm like, no, I think I, I like, first of all there's a safety element right too like no no adult should feel unsafe in the school i, I true no sorry no person right C kids or adults i understand that but i used to and it's like what do, what do you mean by a suspension right because i actually i used to do this i used to have some kids who would really struggle and really have a hard time i'm like look you are we're going to suspend you for five days now what the suspension is going to be you're not going to class you're going to be in my office with me for five days we are we are going to become besties over these next five days it's going to be you whatever you are going to be my shadow but you're not going to class you are going to be in this room and and sometimes and sometimes to be honest with you i'd suspend kids outside of school and there it was and it could be the exact same incident happen and i would determine it based on how do i know this kid what would benefit the most how are they, how are we going to actually think about this and the reason I would actually do those, and, and it wasn't like, because I think some people would say that that's an in-school suspension. I'm like, well, maybe, I guess you could technically call that. It's an in-my-office suspension. Because what that kid needs to know is that, yeah, they screwed up, but I'm not leaving them. I'm not, I'm not going to say, because a lot of times some of the kids have struggled because the first sign of them messing up, the adults have taken off on them. And I'm like, look, I'm not, I know you messed up, but I, you're stuck with me now. And this is, this is how it's going to be. And I saw that that was really effective. Right. So I guess like when, you know, the, it's, it's really kind of understanding the, not just the kid, but the, the kid's situation and really well, knowing your yeah. kids, I think is really important. And and what you're mentioning, which is a, a skill and a talent that, that I know that you have is individualized perception mm -hmm. that, that what works for this kid, it's just not going to work for this kid. Right. And, and w when they're acting out, you know, which is, which is, you know, oh, I don't know, you know, turning a desk over or getting up and walking out or whatever, that's an acting out behavior. And, and honestly, you, I'd rather have that, you know, because you can direct that energy, that's energy going out, right? But when you have a kid 
who is in, who's acting in major depression, that, that would be a diagnosis of some mm. of the kids that we had, or schizophrenic even. And, and if they're acting in, it, it's, it's harder to, to, to get in and, 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 and make them believe that you care about them because they don't care about themselves or anything else. And so that's where drugs, I don't care how many, you know, the Just Say No program, I'm sorry, I've never been a fan of Just Say No. If they, if they could just say no, they would have. You can show them all kinds of scared straight videos and all of that. But if they don't care about themselves and they don't think anybody cares about them, that's an escape. That's all it is. It's, it's a wound. It, they're filling up. They're trying to fill a wound that that is really hard to fill because they just didn't get the basics of care. And anyway, yeah, we, okay, we, so. we, we would actually have some kids. Um, we would actually have some kids. Um, they would like, you know, they'd miss a day of school because of suspension or whatever. And I would always they could not go back into class until they met with me. So they had to meet with me before. And I think historically what many of the kids had dealt with was they would get suspended and then they'd get do you know why you were suspended do you know why this and it's like we're gonna like go over the day how you screwed up and now i'm just gonna set you up to be mad to start the day and just like make you feel guilty and i i would just i would just talk with them i would just hang out just kind of like connect and then we you know we'd kind of like take some time and chill and they and it was really important that they knew that i valued them that even though they made a mistake and I and like I had some parents like, oh, I heard this kid did this. I'm like, have you ever done anything bad when you were a kid? Like, do you do you, are it's just because you got away with it? That's why you're like wanting this. Kid. Like, you just got away with it. That's actually the biggest difference than um, what what this kid has done. Yeah, and now you're now you're asking, and they're you know like sometimes I call them out. I'm like that kid needs to you know kind of has to ensure that they know the adults value them and see a mistake as a mistake and. And how important that is too and i, I think that you know really kind of going from that notion of empathy a lot of like like you said a lot of the a lot of the kids have have dealt with really traumatic situations and things that we couldn't even imagine and really kind of understanding from that perspective yeah, yeah. And, and what you're saying is to them but what i was saying to them was i care about you yeah. enough to to hold you accountable for your yeah. own behavior and and i i wish you hadn't made that choice i hope you don't do it again but you did and so and and we would do overnight suspension yeah it's kind of what you're talking about where where but but we usually had their parents right you, you can come back when your parents come with you because because right. parental involvement you know it, it's just it's just so valuable you know and 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 they're, they're witnessing. I mean, you know, we all are getting to know each other a little bit better, and we're going to have a relationship, you know. And and I'll never forget. I went I went to uh, uh, on the on the Riverwalk in San Antonio. I was at a, mm -hmm. I was doing some some coaching training, and I we a group of us went to this restaurant, and this this maitre d would oh yes sir we'll get your table right here, and and so he came up to me and he said you're Mr. Manning, aren't you? And I said, yes. And he said, I'm sure you remember me because I was always in trouble and always in your office. And I'm sure you remember my father because <laughs> right. he was always up there. And I didn't, George, but I went, of course I do. <laughs> right. <You know>? right. <laughs> and so he said, you were the only one right. that, that cared about me enough to make me responsible for what I was doing. And I, I'm like, this is a moment I don't want ever forget you know right and, and then he told me what he was doing and, and how good he was doing and then he brought us all dessert <laughs> free well, on the house <laughs> you, you know that it's i was thinking about this when you were kind of sharing some of the stuff you know like about some of the situations and uh some of the kids like i remember i remember uh, it's not like i don't teach anymore so maybe you know i, I can't get in trouble for this anymore so <laughs> maybe this is a maybe this is this is the best way i dealt with it i had this teacher saying to me this kid is like so disruptive in class they cannot sit still they are just like just i'm like just let me can i have them for a little bit can i and so i'm like hey what's going on he's like ah he's just you know you can just see the kids antsy so i the gym was open i'm like do some laps just do some laps and he's like really i'm like i want to see how fast you can run so the kid's like 
He's like, tie me. And so we're running. So I actually, I know that sounds weird. I took my laptop. I had to do a bunch of emails. So I'm just sitting in the gym on my laptop while this kid's running laps. And he, and it wasn't like, I'm, it wasn't like, I'm going to run you as a punishment. It's like, this kid just has a ton of energy to burn off and they want to burn off the energy. And so the kid's like, okay, I'm like done. I'm like, okay, do you think you're ready back to class? Yeah. And he was just calm. And it's like a lot of the, a lot of kids actually just need to burn off some energy, right? Like we always see, we, we would see that discipline issues would actually uh, be significantly lower in classrooms if the kids actually went to uh, gym or phys ed the first thing in the morning and just like, they were just antsy and like they're up in the morning and stuff like that too. And then they just needed to kind of burn some energy. And then, you know, that, that for me, I actually do way better just in life if I work out in the morning. And it's like kind of some kids, maybe and some kids, you know, they, they are, that's not their thing. Right. So it's just kind of like, it's kind of yeah. interesting to kind of see that. So like, I kind of like, some of be like, do you just punish this kid by making them run laps? No, no, no. The kid had energy that they wanted to like expand yeah, and they, they were going to run laps. <laughs> it just yeah. wasn't going to be in the gym or in that classroom. We right. like, I prefer the yeah, gym. He was going to get out that energy some way. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. So and, and, and what happens, George, when you when you think about this system, and this was my this was our grandson, who he he struggled, and so he wouldn't finish his homework. And what was the what was the the um, the, the consequence? Okay, you can't go to to, right. to recess. You you stay here and finish your homework. Right. And the, the one thing he needed was to get. He's right, right now. He's a bodybuilder now. I mean that this is the kind of, he's he's disciplined he's he's doing he he looks fantastic you know and 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 that's his focus right now I mean he is you know he's out of, he's out of school you know so but but imagine those kids during the pandemic George that's a whole other right life, isn't it? a whole other story you know well, yeah we don't talk about the pandemic anymore we don't talk about it no we don't talk about it. before we we got on the podcast one of the things that. Uh, you and I talked about, and I was actually saying that, you know, I, I do have an ego. And when I say this, I mean, I want to do really, really well. And what I started to realize in leadership, that if you want to do really well, you have to create an environment where the people who you serve do very well. And, and sometimes ego can be a detriment. And sometimes ego can be a good thing. It depends on how we utilize this. So can you kind of talk a little bit about your kind of views on that? I, I'd love for you to share some of the stuff that you shared with me before we start recording. Okay. Okay. I, I, I ran a principal preparation program where I selected uh, basically master teachers who had been actually sort of tapped Hey, would you like to be an administrator? You have all the skills and all the knowledge that you need and the talent you need to be there. And so I did, I, I had an interview process, uh, recommendations. They had to write some things and, and I did what's called a principal perceiver interview. And, and there were, there were, uh, 12 categories. You kind of kept asking the same question about five different times, but you needed one answer and, and you would, you would mark across like, okay, uh, motivation to manage, you know, why do you want to be a principal? You know, right. and, and, uh, and, and one of the things that, that was on there was ego drive and, and ego drive means I want to be the best e ego drive. Doesn't mean like, okay, let's just say Muhammad Ali, I'm the greatest. And, right. Right. Yeah. You know, and, 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 and that can't be all you have. I mean, you can't just go with that. Like, Oh, I've got a big ego, but right. ego means I, it's quality. It's a standard. I want to be the best. I want to have the best school. I want my kids to do the best. That's really what you need as a principal. And, and along with it, what you need is developer. Every principal has to be a developer. If, if, if they didn't score high on developing other people, they would not be in my program. Right. The, the other thing that goes along with that is individualized perception. We hit on that, George, when we talked about how every kid and every teacher needs something different. And, and uh, every administrator, if you're if you're working yeah. with me, needs something different. So, you know, yeah, th there are other things, too. But but those were the ones that that was a red flag if somebody uh didn't have much of an ego drive. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, didn't, the, I didn't want them in my program. <laughs> well, the, 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 there's actually a, a concept that I talked about in Innovator's Mindset. It was called competitive collaboration. And I, I, I am like, 
I, I think we do this too much in education. We swing pendulums to like crazy sides, right? So it's like when I was uh, a kid in school, uh, basically we did math drills and you would like compete against each other and you try to like, you know, crush everybody in your time tables and be the best at time tables. And now it's like, we don't necessarily want to do that. We want everyone to like, it's just like an overemphasis on collaboration. And I actually, I, I think collaboration is good. I think a little competition is good. So I really was drawn to that term. And when you hear the term competitive collaboration, uh, one of the analogies that I utilized was there was these two biology classrooms and they were different schools and the teachers wanted that their class to be the best, right? So they were actually utilizing a shared hashtag uh, to show like what was going on in their classroom. And so th the kids would connect with each other, you know, in these classrooms through this hashtag. And one of the kids from one class say like, oh, I saw this class is doing this. And the teacher's like, yeah, well, we're, we're going to do something better. And they would actually push each other. But the reason I love the, the notion of competitive collaboration, it, the two teachers worked together as well. It wasn't like, it wasn't like, I'm going to have the best class. Yours is going to suck. And we're going to crush it. It was like, hey, we're pushing each other. And so I want to do really well, but if you need anything, I'm always here for you. So it's kind of like that kind of back and forth. So like when, when we were talking about that, I was, I was really kind of drawn to that notion of competitive collaboration, because I think there, there is a balance of both of that. Hey, I want the best for my kids, but I want the best for all kids. And that means we push each other and, you know, uh, we su supported one each other, uh, one another as well. And so the last question I ask you, this is uh, airing. Hey, 2023, as this is a question I've been asking uh, all my guests, you know, so last couple of years, you know, <laughs> that we don't talk about uh, have been, you know, very all over the place. So as people end, you know, enter 2023, what is something, you know, something they can focus on? What's something that, you know, they're, what they can look forward to in this year, or, you know, something that we could focus on to, to grow as, as individuals and as organizations? Wow. That's a great question. Um, you know, as, as I look into to 2023 and, and I look at, you know, to me, one of the biggest issues is keeping good people in the profession. Uh, that, that and, and, and what you talked about as far as collaboration and even mm -hmm. any kind of collaboration or competitive collaboration, that, that you... You, you do all you can to support those that are still with us and to keep them from getting, because, because things are being piled on to, to right. teachers more and more and more. And there's there. I, and I would say have this strong sense of purpose that, that if, you know, the thing I'm, I'm recognizing about the teacher leaders and, and I coached, I coached a lot of administrators and, and coaching teacher leaders is different in that, what you feel from them is a sense of, of purpose. And they all know why they're there and they're there for kids. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and, and, and so what they, they are willing to, to have critical conversations with administrators about what's going on in the school. I mean, th that's, that's where we, we need to find a way for leaders who are, who are natural leaders and committed and have a purpose to love kids to do that and stay in the classroom, George. I I, I don't know the answer to that, but but I think it can be done. Uh, you know, I think it needs to be done. So I would just want to raise the level of teacher retention and, and teacher appreciation and uh, and going to back and, and, and as an administrator, get out of their way, make things easier for them rather than harder for them. I mean that that could be your one job. I'm, I'm, I'm breaking down the barriers so you can do your job, teacher. Well, you know, we went to school in different, you know, decades when we were kids. And I've always said this, probably the time frame of our school day was almost exactly the same, even though we went to school in different decades. But the expectations upon teachers just keeps growing and growing and growing. And, and you're like, you're expected to do more, but in the same amount of time. And so that starts filtering out outside of school, you know, after and things like that. So you know, based on your advice, one thing I always tell administrators is if you're going to add something on to the plate of teachers, you should be able to take one to two things off, right? You, you have to identify that because even if you, if you don't explicitly say that, and maybe implicitly you're, you, you know, you mean that, 
they, they have to they have to know this is now, okay hey we're gonna move forward with this but we're we're like this is we're done with this we don't need to do this anymore and so really being thoughtful of that uh in that process and if you if you if you can't take one to two things off then don't add one to two things like that. That to me yeah. is a really important aspect, right? Then, then and, and as a coach, I coach the teachers who are leaders who they keep piling on to go back to their administrators and say, sir, uh, I'm doing this, this, and this, and you're adding this to, right. I need you to take something off. So, so they both yeah. have this. Res- I mean, that's why I, I coach yeah. them. I, I do a lot of let's, let's plan a crucial conversation yeah. with your principal because there's, there's, yeah. there's, there's, there's they're swallowed up. They're, yep. they're burdened down, you know, and they get discouraged. And and uh, and I, I don't want them to leave. <laughs> and I, yeah, and I appreciate you saying that because I, I would say this to my staff all the time. I cannot solve a problem I don't know exists. And I think sometimes uh, some people are listening to this right now and they're like, yeah, I wish my administrator knew that. Tell them. S- say something oh, like, yeah. hey, I heard this advice. Like, even just take this, take this snippet of the podcast share like hey what do you think about this like maybe maybe you don't want to say it, but maybe we just said it for you and maybe that will help somebody out there as well so dave one of my one of my favorite things about the podcast is i just get to meet new people get to just sit down and hang out with them so it was it was a pleasure to just chat with you and meet you and spend some time with you today and i'm so glad that people get to learn more about you today you're i told you this before you're one of my heroes and, uh, and I, I'm grateful and, uh, to, to be on this. And I'm honored. Well, so thank I, we're you. Not, I'm not a hero anymore. We're friends, right? So that's, that's we're how friends. we're for it. Okay. So everyone, hey, thank you so much for listening. David, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join me. And I, I hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks for all you do. Take care.